just look at this wonderful countryside. It's part of the variety of scenery that you can see throughout Britain. And I think one of the best ways of seeing it is from the railway. Let me show you. This is my collection of railways, a set of colour slides that I've assembled over the last 35 years. And many of them show trains and lines that have long since disappeared and are just happy memories. Using those slides, and a little imagination, we can make a tour by rail round those parts of Britain of which I'm most fond. And let's start in Carlisle and go round Cumbria with a glimpse of some lines that have come and gone. This map shows you where we are going. First we'll travel south along the famous Settle and Carlisle, as far as Appleby. We'll change there and take the old line to Penrith. This brings us to the West Coast Main Line and we'll journey over the notorious Shap Incline to the next station at Oxenholm. From there we can go in and out of the Lake District whilst travelling round the Cumbrian coast to Workington. To complete the journey we'll travel across the Northern Lake District via Keswick to Penrith and then back to Carlisle. All lines lead to Carlisle and so we'll start there with one of the once ubiquitous London Midland and Scottish Railway designed tank engines known as Jinties, shunting a postal van in 1964. The Settle and Carlisle was the old Midland Railway route from London St Pancras to Carlisle and hence to Scotland. Thankfully, in my view, the line has been saved from closure so we can still travel over it and marvel at the scenery and at the skill of the men who built a railway through it. There's an almost constant uphill gradient of 1 in 100 from Carlisle to the summit at Ays Gill. Not surprising then that the men who worked over it called it the Long Drag. At Dun Cowfold, six miles from Carlisle, is English Electric Type 4 diesel locomotive number D200, now in the National Railway Museum at York, but here at the head of a train from Leeds. Preserved steam trains run this way too. Merchant Navy class clan line from the distant Southern Railway might have passed us on Drybeck Viaduct north of Armouthwaite. Soon afterwards, we enter the beautiful Eden Gorge. Going north is the Thames Clyde Express, which used to link St Pancras with Glasgow St Enoch each day. This view has since been lost in the trees. We also pass through Barren Wood, which can look like this in the autumn. The last steam locomotive built by British Rail, Evening Star, is going our way at Lazenby, 15 miles from Carlisle. We'll then cross the viaduct at Eden Lacey, seen here basking in the evening sunlight. Little and large bridges span the Briggy Beck near Little Selkeld. We could well be in this train. This is a purpose-built train to spray weed killer on the tracks. It's on the northbound track at Langworthby. The Duchess of Hamilton, pride of the Friends of the National Railway Museum, emerges, as we will do, from Wastebank Tunnel near Culgate. Beyond the next tunnel is Evening Star again, on a special train run in memory of the late Eric Tracy, Bishop of Wakefield, and a famous railway photographer. Here we are at Appleby, and we'll have to imagine a change of train and also a change of station from Appleby West, as it used to be called, on the Settle and Carlisle, to Appleby East, on the line from Darlington to Penrith, which closed in 1962. Never mind, it's only a few yards walk between the two stations. From Appleby, we pass through Clifton Moor Station, seen here when nature had taken over following closure. Then we reach Penrith. Penrith used to be an important junction at the northern gateway to the Westmoreland Fells. It stands on the line from London Euston to Scotland, 
which is known today as the West Coast Main Line. As we've seen, the line from Darlington used to come in here, and also one from Keswick and Workington, by which we shall return photographically later. In the meantime, let's take a train down the West Coast Main Line as far as Oxenholm. Today, our train with its electric engine will make short shrift of the one in 75 climb over the fells to Shap Summit. But in steam days, this route put both engine and engine man to the test. Shap Station, shown in this picture, was closed in 1968. The summit signal box, too, has gone. As we coast downhill, we can recall panting steam engines hauling green coaches from the southern region. Today, colour light signals guide our driver. But in 1960, semaphore signals like this one, then not less than 50 years old, and tall enough for the driver to see for a great distance, still stood at Scout Green. Imagine having to climb it once a week to change the paraffin lantern. The Royal Scot, hauled by a Duchess class loco, is heading for Glasgow. Followed by that portion of the Lakes Express bound for Keswick. Part has already been detached for Windermere. We'll visit both places later. Huge clouds of smoke from goods trains were common on Shap. Extra engines were needed to push the heaviest trains up the hill. These banking engines, as they were called, were kept on the right of our train at T-Bay. The site of the shed is now under the M6 motorway. We pass through the Loon Gorge, and at the far end is Low Gill, the junction for Ingleton and Leeds until 1964. A relief train to the London-bound Royal Scot passes by. Relief trains were run at busy times, literally to relieve congestion on the main train. To attract people to travel on them, relief trains depart the head of the main train. From Low Gill, our modern electric train runs down to Oxenholm, where in this picture taken in September 1964, this Duchess class locomotive is named after its designer, Sir William Stanier. We're going to change into the branch train for Windermere, something we can still do today. We'll call it Kendall, but I'm afraid the station is no longer as well kept as it was when this picture was taken in 1964. Next stop, Burneyside, where roses complete the rural scene. The terminus at Windermere looked like this in May 1959. Note the headline on the newsstand about speed record breaker Donald Campbell. Back to the main line at Oxenholm. And now we'll go a little further south to join the old Furness Railway to Arnside and round the Cumbrian coast. Until 1942 you could travel direct from Oxenholm to Arnside, keeping within what has become Cumbria. The junction was at Hincaster, you can see the embankment veering away to the right of this train. This old picture is one of a collection I have taken by the late John Maynard Tomlinson, who was born at Poultonley Fylde and took many railway photos in the 20s and 30s. It shows the little train that used to run between Grange over Sands and Kendal by way of Hincaster and is crossing the River Bella at Sandside. Goods traffic survived at Sandside itself until 1968. It was quite common in those last days of steam for large locomotives like this Class 5 to haul short trains, as this slide of mine shows. This is Arnside Station, with a freight train heading the way we've come towards Sandside. 
From Arnside, we could ride all the way back to Carlisle along the Cumbrian coast, changing perhaps at Barrow. And what a fine run it is, though a bit slow at times. To Barrow, the railway is much shorter than the main road, for it cuts across the river estuaries. First, the Kent at Arnside. We shall come along here after crossing the River Kent. As Class 50 locomotives were short-lived on the London Barrow service, they are particularly worthy of record. A British Railway's standard Class 4 locomotive hurries a mixed freight train over this causeway, which takes the line into Grangeover Sands. Grangeover Sands Station remains a handsome building. Preserved l &E r Class A4, Sir Nigel Gresley, Another engine named after its designer, and sister of the famous engine Mallard, comes through bound for Carnforth. Steamtown at Carnforth has become an important centre for the railway preservation movement. This is their first special train in 1970, following our route at Grange. The second estuary we cross is the River Leven between Cark and Alverston. These two preserved locos, Mayflower Leading Green Arrow, are passing Plumpton, junction of the siding for Glaxo Laboratories. Until 1963, this was the junction also of the Lakeside branch. Let's digress a little and follow the old branch up to the southern shore of Lake Windermere at Lakeside Station. The line was a sort of working museum right up to the end. This noble signal is said to have been here since 1880. Haverthwaite Yard used to be shunted by an old engine built in 1894. Designed by Mr S. W. Johnson for the Midland Railway, these engines were at the time I took this picture some of the oldest running anywhere on the British Railway system. I took this view in 1960. Happily, as this panoramic view displays, the line has been reopened from here by the privately owned Lakeside and Haverthwaite Railway. Both in BR days and now, the tracks end here at Lakeside. The Johnson Loco has made it. And so has the Lake Steamer Teal, which has been sailing here in various ownerships for years, bringing tourists from Ambleside and Bowness. Trains from London turn back at Barrow. Here's one in the days when BR standard Britannia class locomotives provided the motive power but we're going to carry on round the coast towards Carlisle. Two stations on from Barrow, we shall be at Kirkby in Furness. Here's an interesting train there in 1960. Behind the engine is a London North Western Railway six-wheeled milk van, which must have been all of 40 years old at the time. Our next station, Foxfield, was the junction for Coniston until 1962. The branch to Coniston was another of those lines that changed very little during its entire lifespan. I was lucky enough to travel in the brake van of the goods train that sauntered up and down the branch from time to time. So we can turn back the clock and relive that journey with the photographs that I took that day. The train was pulled by one of those little XLMS six-wheeled tank engines known as Jinties, like the one we saw at Carlisle at the start of our journey. Here's the train waiting by the washing, hanging out to dry at the first station, Broughton in Furness. Then at Woodland. By the road at Dendron, as the fireman opens the level crossing gate. And finally, at Coniston itself, where the fells dominate the scene. Back to today, and our journey round the coast, on from Foxfield to Millham, 
some five miles or so. Preserved West Country class loco from the Southern Railway, City of Wells, is on a charter train run by British nuclear fuels. And the famous engine, Flying Scotsman, going the other way near Sylcroft on a glorious sunny evening. Going our way is Grizzly V2 class Green Arrow with 13 on. Soon we call it Bootle Station, the one in Cumbria, not Lancashire. Look at the signal, signal box, gates and southbound engineer's train. Then we cross the Esk Vada, seen here first from the fells. And then in the early days of steam preservation, when locos had to run back to back to avoid the need to turn. Our next station is Ravenglass, seen here with another steam haul excursion from Sellafield. We'll pause here briefly and look at some old postcards of the Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway. Known affectionately as the Retty, this narrow gauge railway started life serving quarries in the fells to the east of Ravenglass and is still busy today carrying tourists. I took this picture in 1960 before modern tourism began in earnest. And this one from a train at Erton Road before even covered coaches were provided. On our journey towards Carlisle, we soon reach Seascale, where Flying Scotsman is in evidence again, heading south, having turned back at Sellafield. Ten miles from there, we enter Corkical Tunnel, notorious for its narrow bore and length. This is another of my collection of pictures by John Maynard Tomlinson. It shows the signals at the south end of the tunnel, which govern the junctions at the other end. Here is the other end and a train probably like the one we're using in Whitehaven Branstey Station. At Providence Bay, near the next station at Parton, our train may well be washed by the tide. In the distance we can see the hills of Galloway. Two stations further on is Workington, which as you can see has been renovated by British Rail. The postal, carrying mail to Huddersfield, is in the bay platform at the far end. We have to change trains at Workington for the last leg of our journey back to Carlisle. We're going to take the old line across northern Lakeland through Keswick and Penrith. Sadly, it shut in 1966. First, an eastbound diesel multiple unit pauses at Cockermouth station. and another at Bassenthwaite Lake, where the line followed the shore of the lake itself and has been replaced by the trunk road. In the year the line closed, 1966, I travelled over it in a special train which came from Manchester via the Settle and Carlisle. Here's the train standing in Keswick Station. The next station towards Penrith was Threlkeld. This view is looking back towards Keswick. The Lakes Express is bound for Keswick as the sun sets over Great Mel Fell. Snow is not that common in the Lake District. This view is taken from the Manchester Rail Tour near Penruddock. This was in April. And we join the West Coast Main Line at Penrith once more, where a special train is carrying delegates to the Keswick Convention. At Penrith Station, there's just time to change trains for the last time and head speedily north along the main line back to Carlisle and the end of our journey. 
I've enjoyed taking you on this imaginary rail tour of Cumbria. I hope you'll join me again sometime and make another journey with the help of my railway collection. In the meantime, back to reality. Goodbye.